Um, hello, everyone. My name is Katie Chukrov. I'm Associate Professor of uh, Philosophy School of uh, Higher School of Economics. And I'm really glad to be part of this set of lectures investigating cosmism and its dimensions nowadays. Um, my lecture is titled Topological Dialectics of uh, Cosmology. And today I will speak not simply about the breakthroughs into cosmism and what it means um, in terms of futurology or technology, but rather uh, on our capacity to see simple things or basic things in cosmological dimension and how this would somehow affect material being and consequently the social being as well. Mm. We live in a period um, when the expansion in outer space turns to be the competition between American billionaires and Russian show business representatives, uh, and rather becomes an Instagram highlight than the quest into a uh, universe or outer space and its uh, research. Likewise, most advanced forms of digital technology do not necessarily presuppose enhancement of cognition or of social agency in its planetary and cosmological dimension. On the contrary, for example, uh, let's take Abkhazia, a post-war ruinated rock state, uh, which is chosen by Russian businessmen to make it into a semi-legal techno park of Bitcoin mining. Said to imagine that its population now lives in daily darkness, and shortages of electricity, despite the fact that most advanced technologies are applied in the region. This is to say that cosmotechnics in this case do not enlighten, but keep one in the Instagram or darknet incarceration. In other words, one can experience technical renaissance, but remain in epistemic and cognitive darkness. Actually, Plato's fable on cave departs from the idea of captivation in the cognitive darkness. It posits cosmology as an indispensable dimension in that it is not only about technical conquest of space external to the dark cave, but it is about enlightenment of consciousness, which has to acquire cosmological vision and knowledge on how things are. So we need cosmos not to simply acquire new play places and new locations to conquer uh, and domesticate some alienated realms, but to change something in our being and in our consciousness. According to Plato's fable, things in the cave are seen as shadows because they are not in doubt there by concepts or ideas. They are not ideated. And things can acquire concepts only due to seeing how they could exist outside uh, the cave in the open light. So that this light is then brought inside of the cave to illuminate it and let those shadows become things in the proper general ideated sense rather than just be the pieces of blank matter. As we remember, it is philosopher who initiates that act of enlightenment, connecting the material and the conceptual parameters of things. Now, as soon as things are perceived through their meanings and concepts, that is, as soon as they are not confined to their limited application in the cave's darkness, they start to exist generally, universally, cosmologically. If we now take for a comparison a Faustian method of enlightenment, here we also see uh, that Faust's project is in leaving the cave, but uh, he never returns back to those people captivated in the dark and keeps enlightening knowledge to himself solely. As the sample of this contemporary artistic realization of such egotistic illuminism, uh, one could mention the project of Karl Heinz Stockhausen, who claimed creating music for neo humans with cosmic consciousness. And this would be the music that would remain incomprehensible for the majority of simple people 
who merely reproduce and consume. Interestingly, the post-structuralist critique of enlightenment, conversely, developed the anti-cosmological topology. Uh, in the works of Lyotard, Deleuze, Guattari, the anti-Platonic move resides in staying within the cave, defying the light of the outer space, and uh, paving the roots and labyrinths instead uh, so as to keep within the imminence of the cave. Guattari called such real chaosmosis. And Pierre Boulez, a French composer who invented the technique of surrealism, um, and who quite in the vein with Lyotard and Deleuze's rejection of cosmological order, defied aesthetics of harmonized universe, uh, developed the metaphor of osmosis instead of cosmos. Osmosis implies the focus on the biomolecular, biochemical immanence of contingent elemental intersections, rather than projecting new forms of organized harmony into an envisaged horizon. Now in the cosmological dimension, be it Russian cosmism or the communist cosmology, the new condition is acquired in the disposition between the dark cave and the outer enlightened space. And this new condition is that there is no boundary between the cave and the outer space. Uh, and then this limitation between the captivated realm and the open realm can be surpassed altogether. The principal philosophic consequence to this removal of the boundary between the cave and the outer realm of knowledge would be the further change of the status of things. So if we remove this boundary between captivation of the dark cave and the outer open enlightened space, we simply get the the shift, uh, uh, the new status of things. Things in the light of reason are the ideated things or the nominal things when noises, concept, idea is not merely exercised rhetorically or speculatively detached from thinkness, but it emanates from things. This can happen only when matter and idea are not split into physical and concrete thinkness versus thinking as abstract brain activity. So there is no um, divergence between material thingness and uh, thinking activity. Today, we often speak about smart things, smart homes, interiors, parks, urban contexts. But these are mainly acquisition of technology and design, much more than of ethics or of political economy or of specific mode of consciousness. Meanwhile, for instance, according to Vernadsky, things which would exist in no sphere would not simply be endowed with technical smartness, but they would be noetic, ideated, as they are not anymore the dead matter, but could as well be the agents of universal reason as the outcome of the inevitable transition from biosphere, uh, uh, from from biosphere into nosphere, as Vernadsky puts it. Now, when Plato's cave of blind matter and its outer enlightened space become one, even a piece of bread or any object would be seen as if in cosmological dimension. And therefore, even that piece of bread can be an ideated piece of bread rather than simply a consumed object or a commodity. Ilya Kabakov in his installations gave us numerous examples when profane plain things are seen as if in cosmos and from cosmos. And actually art often provided examples of revealing ideation in things. Communism drew the philosophic obsession about converging mind and matter, things and ideas, bodies and thinking to its utmost. Yet it did so not through belief or ritual, not through 
technical devices or psychedelic appliances, but communism achieved this through the overturn of political economy when economy was subjected to the rule of use value, when the surplus value was removed from it, from production. So this was the um, device of communism in transformation of things, in uh, endowing uh, things with uh, opened cosmological dimension. Why is this crucial in converging mind and matter? Because the surplus value makes a commodity out of any object so that it loses the opportunity to be what it is. Marx defined this illusionary status of commodities when they attract but cannot be what they are as verwandelte formen, converted forms of things. In a commodity, what could form the ideation of an object and what enables to see the object in general terms is thus distorted and turns into an abstract added cost, into a phantasmatic abstraction. So monetization surplus value are abstractions, whereas ideation, which permeates and which might permeate things and objects and material being, is generalization. And it's uh, important to make distinction between this abstraction and generalization. A good example of monetized abstraction is Warhol's Coke can. In it, we are not concentrated on the Coke can itself, but on the extrapolated surplus value turned into a metaphysical index, as Diedrich Diedrichsen uh, put it. In this case, a monetized abstraction turns into a sublime substance of valorization. The same happens, for instance, when the consumers depend on the semantics of branded things. For example, when one purchases sneakers by Kanye West for $10,000, one buys the capitalized and symbolized surplus and not simply a sportswear. Here, semantic ideation of a thing is superseded with the boosted value, erasing the expediency of a thing, of a footwear. The politeconomic mode of devoiding things of their illusionary phantasmatic status implies reducing them to use value, which enables to connect their thingness with the semantic conceptual and nominal ideative dimension. And this enables to see things then in their cosmological dimension too, as we see things in their general universal sense. The act that found its forms of realization in socialist political economy and socialist semantics of material culture. So in certain sense, historical communism tried to realize in cosmism's goal about no sphere by means of reducing concrete objects to their semantic ideated impact uh, and thus revealing that political economic transformation would be an indispensable stage in the no spherization of material being. Boris Groys, in his book Communist Postscript, called this impact of a socialist object linguistic as against the one that things and objects exert when they are seen through merely commodity exchange. Meanwhile, today objects can be smart, digitized, but they still remain commodities. I mean, this digitization and technological uh, excellence um, doesn't help them to stop to be commodities. What we have not achieved so far is pulling objects and their production out of the logic of surplus value and exchange. Uh, the Soviet Marxist uh, philosopher Evald Dilienkov, in his dialectical logic in the section on Spinoza shows that all material activity, various forms of labor or production in their physical realization are as well thinking procedure. So physical being can as well be a thinking being. Hence thought is not located merely in brain or confined to abstract speculation, 
but it can be revealed in material activity or labor too. Material being is able to contain the ideated components and bear in itself the thinking procedures. Actually, Ilyenkov's early philosophic phantasmagoria titled Cosmology of the Spirit hinges on the idea that matter is not blind nature, but it encompasses the potentiality to think that cosmological dimension of material being confirms such capacity and that communism approximates the condition when concrete matter and things get inscribed into the procedure of thought and thus meta from the very beginning of its generation bears the potentiality of communist being. Thus in this treatise, Ilyankov modifies Spinoza's premise that matter and mind are the attributes of substance, but then Ilyankov shifts it a little bit claiming that it is mind itself that is the attribute of matter. So he intensifies um, Spinoza's um, premise. Just to remind in short about the context of Ilyankov's cosmology of spirit, as we know from various AI or cybernetic theories, in them struggle with entropy resides in applying technology to preserve the homeostasis of material life against the second law of thermodynamics. According to this law, the universe should cool down and undergo extinction. Um, converse ideas, on the contrary, welcoming entropy, we can find with Marquis de Sade or Nietzsche, who uh, insist that it is for the better if this eclipse happens as soon as possible. Uh, Lars von Trier develops such Nietzschean mood in his melancholia. So this is a completely opposite uh, standpoint. As for Nikolai Fyodorov, his cosmist struggle with entropy is implemented by means of the factory of retroactive resurrection of all who had been born and termination by this token of any new birth. Um, and I think uh, during this series of lectures, you had chance to hear about this. Now, Ilyenkov's approach and his cosmology of spirit to struggle entropy is a little bit more complex. Um, and I will say a few words about it. Uh, so according to this theoretic phantasmagoria, when the universe might be gradually cooling down in its eclipse, even despite the human culture and communist society might have invented various technologies to keep this process as slow as possible, the act to accelerate the decline and thus cause another rebirth of meta in its primary youth is voluntarily committed by human thinking mind, which has to die in coercive ending of this gradual cooling and in favor of a rebirth of new young fiery matter. The self-resignation of mind in its self-destruction produces then the excess of energy which allows to accelerate the extinction, to accelerate the cooling down and um, eventually generate the future beginning. In that case, even entropy does not take place contingently but it takes place ethically as a decision of thinking spirit who kills itself and accelerates cooling to approximate the birth of new life. To repeat interesting in this allegation is that the rebirth of matter, as well as the accelerated eclipse of life is a conscious act of mind, which chooses to resign consciously. And in that case, nature does not collapse blindly and does not circulate blindly. This is 
to confirm that dialectical speculation literally fosters the formation of meta out of fiery substance, which emerges due to acceleration of decline. In other words, the movement of meta is impossible without thinking procedures permeating it. And in such standpoint, Ilyenkov reveals, of course, a Spinozist attitude, but as well a politeconomic one with which he endows his own dialectics of nature. Uh, another influence which should be mentioned in this connection is, of course, dialectics of nature by Friedrich Engels. Thus, this suicidal self-resignation of mind goes beyond entropy as well as beyond anti-entropy. Thought and its capacity to self-resign from life are an ethical and philosophic act, but simultaneously, it is such self-resignation that initiates forming of the materiality of cosmos. Thus, death becomes a creative act that transforms the cooling degradation of life into warmth uh, and light again. In this complicated dialectics, it is death that presupposes immortality, paradoxically, because a thinking mind on its communist stage of development, on the stage of classless society, and hence on the stage of use value economics, is able to make a Socratic resignation, to terminate the homeostasis of cooling and launch the rebirth of matter by means of its own voluntary annihilation. And it's interesting that Ilyenkov uses the word renaissance, bazrajdinia, rebirth, rather than resurrection. So although the goal to converge the matter and mind, as well as the goal to reproduce life might be similar with Fedorov's cosmist edifice, still there are differences between Fedorov's quasi-religious project of resurrection and Ilyenkov's philosophic and communist one of, um, of rebirth, which presupposes uh, that a new politeconomic dimension is indispensable for this nosferization and new achievement of cosmological dimension. As I said, in Ilyenkov's parable, Cosmology of Spirit, communism plays principal part in nosferization of meta. This process is implementable only through engagement in communist activity. For Fedorov too, the commons of human activity matter a lot to plan and to project and to regulate such a direction. Yet for Fedorov, nosferic transformation takes place rather biophysically, biochemically, or technologically. Whereas for Ilyenkov, it happens much more through the socialist modes of labor and production. That is due to the specific turn in the consciousness of human sociality and less due to biophysical and pharmacochemical transformation of things. And I will be explaining what is the difference because you can say that, well, social transformation or political transformation presupposes technological transformation as well. But um, I will try to account for this, um, some sort of uh, transorganic, postorganic, biopolitical, biotechnical transformation and uh, constant bearing in mind that social transformation should be a conscious transformation or the nominal transformation and speculative and philosophical transformation constantly, even when we deal with the mat material, new material um, uh, visions of being. In Fedorov's system, it suffices to develop certain conceptual formula of action once, 
for instance, there is some kind of technological uh, or mathematical or biomathematical formula. And then this formula can be applied multiple times and can be replicated in various activities. The idea in that case is applied to things and is not dialectically stemming from material activity with each set of acts. For Elienkov, then, the dialectical speculation never stops until human mind is living. So it's converse. Um, so in each application of objecthood, there should be the dimension of noumenal philosophic procedure. And this is probably the difference between simply um, intellect applied to living and thus nosferization and philosophic speculation constantly reverberating within materiality as Ilyenkov depicts it. Why? Because human mind exists, exists not merely in the brain, but in all things produced and created by human labor. In that case, labor is not simply the replication of certain idea or know-how conceived once and then automatically repeated numerous times, this would simply be a technological implementation of uh, invention. But in materialist dialectics, the ideated dimension of things and of material being has to evolve permanently. And it is sought not in technical devices or technical implementation of certain ideas, but it occurs in broader interrelation of material objects, systemic connections, and in the logic of their social action. So the material being is the logic itself, is the dialectical logic itself. And this means that things are not simply smart due to technical digitization, but that they are ideated because they are general and social. Thus, keeping the social dimension constantly presupposes keeping the philosophical dimension as well. This is why political economy was philosophic for Marx and uh, likewise for Ilyenko. Um, now I will uh, emphasize um, a little bit a different point and skip to a different issue. Um, to Fedorov, to Fedorov's rebuke to philosophy. And one of these main rebukes uh, on the part of Fedorov um, was that in philosophy, there is the syndrome of separation, separation between theoretical mind and practical mind, as we have it in Kant's uh, critique, for instance, pure reason and practical reason. And uh, initially, I thought that this separation between practical reason and theoretical reason <clears throat> is the same separation that we have between mind and matter. Uh, but gradually thinking through this issue, I understood that uh, these are different types of separ separation. So the type of separation that we have between practical mind and theoretic mind is a different type of distinction than what we have between divergence of things and thinking. Such separation, according to Fedorov, had to be overcome. So for Fedorov, separation between cognitive mind and meta was of the same mode. Yet, I would suggest that Fedorov confuses here different modes of separation. Separation between spirit and matter 
and separation between utilitarian mindfulness and philosophic speculation. The project of overcoming the gap between mind and matter is necessary for philosophy, whereas the gap between practical reason and the speculative reason is a proper separation for philosophy. It presupposes important distinction between the functional mind, Verstand, on the one hand, and the speculating reason, Vernunft, on the other. This distinction between two modes of reasoning, non-philosophic, utilitarian on the one hand, and philosophic, the general cosmological one on the other, is ontoepistemically different from the dualist rupture between things and concepts, between things and ideas. In other words, precisely the separation of the thinking reason from the utilitarian mindfulness is necessary for philosophy to exert the dialectical convergence of the thing and idea of the body and spirit. Without such separation, the formation of the altruist reason of communist cosmology that projects common good as necessity and is free from the private and selfish interest would be impossible. And hence the mind without focus on philosophic speculation would not be able to deprive things from surplus value and the convergence of the abstract and the concrete would in that case be unimplementable. And indeed, it is due to specifying the precisely speculative philosophic mind, it is due to separating philosophic mind from the utilitarian mind that one is able to exceed private interests in practical life, and thus due to speculative quality of thinking, the practice of living increases its communist general cosmological coefficient too. Dialectics as a speculative technique is thus itself a separation of reasoning from phrenesis, the utilitarian mindfulness, uh, as Stigler defined it. And finally, uh, and I'm ending with this, one of the reasons why Russian cosmism is at times difficult to be inscribed in philosophy is that it locates God into the place of the idea. And it operates with God as with something present in a guaranteed way. So when solving the problem of a gap between mind and thing, Nikolai Fedorov tries to solve it through converging God and human being converging divinity and humanity through biotechnological regulation. Actually, this often happens in transhumanism too. For instance, Yuval Harari speaks that, um, and even Ray Kurzweil, that uh, this convergence would, would be uh, on the level of making a human being sort of divinity by means of technological enhancement. But in philosophy, since Descartes and his cogito, God or divinity is not associated anymore with the transcendent or with the ideal. This is because philosophy starts to reflect on overcoming dualities between mind and matter already after and beyond God, when God is placed outside thinking and therefore need not be associated with spirit or the ideal or reason. The spirit, the reason remains as with Hegel, but God is not what philosophic spirit or idea is. Hence groundlessness of philosophy and the processual permanence of speculative effort. You cannot generate idea once and then replicate it in uh, practice. Philosophy needs constant speculation. Ilyenkov's treatise demonstrates this groundlessness deprived of divine guarantee very vividly. And even already with Descartes, we see that this constant speculation is what groundlessness of philosophy is about. 
Therefore, for philosophy, since Descartes, God does not participate imminently in the project of unity of things and ideas. God is outside the frame and thereby dialectics develops without divinity so that the idea and the ideal, even philosophic metaphysics will not re need uh, reverence to God. Um, I would end here. Um, and we could shift to Q and A. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. So we can now maybe take some questions. I have a question, if I, if I may. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the for the talk, um, and I would like to understand better what Ilenko means by this thinking mind, especially how uh, it relate how this thinking mind relates to individual human beings. Whether it's this thinking mind um, that can be uh, that can attain this. Um, complete altruism and think these thoughts or wish the, the demise of the universe on behalf of all life, whether, how is this thinking mind related to individual human minds? Is it something that uh, each individual can attain? And when we are in this state, we can make this wish or is it an abstracted mind uh, Mm. Uh, that that uh, has nothing to do with individual human minds. Uh, and what do you mean by individual human mind? Because uh, the by uh, minds of persons of individual uh, yeah, persons. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the idea of Hegel and Marx and Ilyenko was that there is no individual mind. Mm. Mind can only be general, and this was idea of general intellect as well with Marx that if we can talk about reason at all. That's why I was, I was talking about this practical application of mind. Like you have certain kind of smartness and you can individually apply this or you can even make a certain invention. But uh, reason as such can only be uh, general. And this is the reason why it is cosmological. Uh, so when we apply this kind of reason, even if it is applied by a person, it can only be general and universal uh, mind. So when Socrates is choosing to die, he's not applying individual reason in this ethical act, but he's applying general and uh, cosmological or universal reason in this act. So each person bears in oneself uh, individual mind and trans-individual mind or meta-individual mind. Otherwise, we would not be human beings, uh, uh, but some other creatures. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I understand that now. Uh, and can I have another question or sure. is someone else waiting? Uh, I was really interested in the um, idea of, of osmosis that you discussed early on in the lecture. Uh, and uh, But I didn't managed to take down the, is it some does the idea is it Ilyenko's idea or is it no, no. Uh, uh, this is not Ilyenko's idea on the contrary yeah Ilyenko never touched upon this this was the uh, this um, this is the idea of biochemistry uh, and it's about uh, molecular transition yeah, yes it, but about using the metaphor yeah, it, it, I, it's, it is used uh, uh, precisely, as you said, as a metaphor, but um, it was developed uh, uh, very proliferously by Pierre Boulez. Pierre Boulez is a composer. And um, uh, his idea was that music has to bid farewell to certain kind of unities, like the unity of melody, the unity of harmony, and it should dissect itself into some kind of molecules, molecules which are dissociated. So this molecular dissociation, which keeps you within imminence. So you, 
imagine that you as human being are also part of this molecular dissociation. You, you cannot collect yourself into any kind of vision or any kind of introspection or any kind of teleological projection, uh, but you are within certain kind of molecular movement. So uh, the, um, uh, the, the idea of osmosis meant that uh, we remain within some kind of uh, microscope where the molecules are uh, oscillating. And uh, the truth of our life is this biomolecular biochemical oscillation, because this is real matter. And inventing certain kind of visions and adding adding something to uh, produce some, some bigger entities uh, would be simple idealism. So uh, the idea of osmosis against cosmosis, because cosmos is order, cosmos is harmony, cosmos is then ideology. And osmosis uh, was applied by Boulez and then repeated by Deleuze as this uh, rejection to, to be ideological, to, to construct certain kind of order or teleology. Thank I think you. Armin Gorske has a question too. Uh, Katie, hello, Anton, hello, hello friends. Thank you so much for the lecture. Thank you so much for, for all this concept, all this bibli bibliography. Thank you. I, I, I'm eager to start uh, reading Ilyanka for, uh, after the lecture ends. I, I just have a question. Uh, could you tell me, Katie, this idea of universal, transpersonal, all productive mind, uh, which itself, I suppose, transcends this dualism of mind and matter of inner and outer, how it correlates with this division of, you mentioned this division of practical mind and speculative mind, uh, which is uh, important, which is uh, a dominative uh, case for resolving this dualism. How could you, uh, could you articulate these intentions, this uh, connection between this transpersonal mind, uh, productive mind and uh, this, uh, this two, this division of practical and speculative mind, if possible. Yes, uh, actually, you know, it's, uh, it's my new observation and which was instigated by uh, the question from Nikolai Smirnov, by the way, when he was editing my text. Um, and uh, 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 actually, mm, uh, mm, uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the first reaction is that, okay, if we want to terminate this division between things and uh, th thoughts, then of course we have to terminate the division between uh, speculative, theoretical, philosophic uh, uh, thinking, philosophic mind and practical application, the mind that practically applies something. And uh, I, I also agreed with this initially, but then I understood that it's not that simple, that the connection, uh, the, the connection of things and uh, um, uh, ideas happens dialectically. And these dialectics cannot be exerted and implemented without the help of struggle of speculative mind with the applied mind. So um, the question is about not simply automatic, um, automatic fusion uh, of, or performative fusion of uh, one in, into another, uh, but the um, dialectical representation, and I will uh, I, I will explain how. Um, you know, um, uh, I, I already mentioned this idea of di uh, dialectics. The main thing, the principal thing, in which is being the other, So, um, uh, this capacity to be the other uh, is. Uh, um, discerned in meta, 
So meta can be the other in terms of at the same time being the concept. And uh, um, uh, even if you take any object, for instance, the object is material, it has its own pragmatic applied being, but it has also cultural being, spiritual being, application of human minds, application of human invention. So it is many, many, many things uh, at the same time. And it dialectically contains and inscribes in itself this otherness. Uh, now, we cannot find literal meaning within uh, the object. And this rejection that the object has literal being uh, uh, is... Um, made possible by the, um, by the dialectical speculation. I don't know whether, it, it's complicated, I agree, but I'm sure that I'm right. And uh, uh, that this division uh, uh, between philosophic mind and applied technocratic or scientific mind, which uh, Hegel is insisting in his phenomenology of spirit, because he insists that philosophy does not deal with the, the mind that deals with, for instance, chemistry. It has to uh, somehow um, exceed it into uh, another procedure. Uh, and without this uh, specific dialectical capacity, you will not see things in their general sense. Because, I mean, imagine that you see things in only applied sense, then you will see them in literal sense. You will see them uh, in some sort of objectivized uh, and uh, applied sense. And this is the problem of um, um, Fyodorov too, because he says, we have certain idea Okay, the idea is already guaranteed. We have God, God is guaranteed. And now if we apply this idea into the factory of production, this factory uh, uh, functions and functions and functions, but how to rejuvenate this factory with nonstop ideation? He doesn't have that tool. Uh, and this is dialectics. So, um, uh, 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 you have to constantly think. Uh, it is not possible that certain objects stop to be philosophical even for one second. Whereas uh, the uh, approach of uh, Fyodorov is that, okay, uh, we have uh, the idea of second coming, we have Holy Spirit, uh, we have um, uh, Holy Grace, uh, and now we can launch uh, the labor of uh, reproducing and replicating it. Uh, whereas the um, dialectical procedure uh, never stops to inject this thingness with the ideation. And this is the, the difference. This is because anything is doubted. You can never stop this philosophical um, deconstructive doubt about anything. Uh, that's why, for instance, Reza Nigoristani is saying that philosophy is simply not functional uh, and it is simply stupidity because it constantly doubts and slows things down, uh, whereas we have to make them functional and more pragmatic. So Ketja, do you see the, the, this um, kind of um, emancipation of objects or some kind of a reconciliation between um, thinking matter and non-thinking matter as a central issue for the whole thing, as the se central task? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, I, um... I think uh, this can be a cosmological task, definitely. But uh, uh, the question is that um, for um, Fyodorov, uh, this is not uh, discussed. I mean, he does not discuss 
practically and technically how this inscription of um, conceptualization will take place uh, in reproduction of these bodies. And therefore, I think that uh, the way Boris Groys depicts it as simply um, artificial objects, art objects, human beings as art objects, I, I, I definitely agree with, uh, agree with this. Uh, some kind of uh, museum uh, exhibit that is an art object. Um, um, but this is a little bit different from uh, a communist project, I think, because, uh, well, a communist human being is a new human being, but he's not a museum exhibit, definitely. It's a neo-human or neo-subject or constant novelty to oneself, but I don't think that it can be objectified as Boris Groys um, um, uh, describes it. He had a wonderful metaphor that uh, you can look at the human being from the outside as the body. Um, and uh, uh, in that case, what happens in that body and what this body thinks is not so, is not so crucial as long as it is already um, performed act of resurrection. And this is Lazarus, it's a performed act, act of resurrection. Uh, but uh, whether this will be Christ or whether each will be Socrates or which, whether each will be a philosopher, this is a question. So communism is the project where, uh, when each has to be a philosopher. I mean, ideally in terms of... Um, oh, so not only, we're not only talking about human subjects, we're also talking about objects, we're talking about how would my uh, sort of emancipated uh, commodity of a refrigerator exist in communism? Yeah, so let's say if it's an intelligent refrigerator that automatically reorders milk for me when I run out of milk, right, which is what under capitalist conditions is called intelligence, you know, yeah, right? And that maybe instead of ordering milk, it ponders about the production of milk, the life of cows, its own, or how, how do you picture? I had, I, had, I had this vision, you know, I had this vision, uh, maybe I'm mistaken, um, but um, mm, I had this vision from socialist past, somehow uh, when, you have a favorite object, it, it somehow communicates with you, but if you look at it uh, from the outside, it can be ugly, it cannot be technologically well applicable, but it has, uh, it has grown into being. So, um, for instance, uh, when... It's not animated object of religion. It's not animated object of Japanese uh, uh, spir spiritism, for instance, but it's a certain sort of responsiveness of, of things and the attitude to things. Uh, and I think that uh, such things are impossible without our own uh, um, ethical transformation the way we look at them. I mean, it would be stupid to imagine that things can develop uh, uh, sovereign subjectivity to talk to us. Although in, uh, in case of second coming, this is possible. I mean, many theology, theo theologists speak that second coming would be a new quantum condition when things could be responsive, when walls could be transparent and you could go through the walls, but not because this is magic, but this is a new quantum um, condition, new um, cosmophysical um, uh, space. But I mean something else. Uh, the, the type of production and the type of human sociality which produces certain kind of things. 
the attitude to which is different and the application of which is uh, different. Uh, and in that sense, um, it is different because it is ideated. Uh, for instance, you, in this sense, you would not be able to, to desire an object, but to be, to be thoughtful about the object or maybe to, I don't know, to share the object with someone. Uh, rather than uh, uh, desire it as a commodity or collect it, or the very application and interior production or interior application of objects then uh, could be different. Yeah. But it's also uh, some sort of uh, utopian construct because we don't know uh, such production. Although um, I- What about I, I, an art? What about an art? An art object. Uh, what would be an art object of art? Yeah, because it has a slightly more complicated. Uh, I mean, yes, sure, it could uh, become a commodity. Of course, under many conditions, it becomes a commodity. But under some conditions, it does not. Yeah, and it has a life. Sure, uh, but I uh, I don't know art that uh, is not. Uh, endowed nowadays with any surplus symbolic meaning so that it is circulated and then recirculated and then uh, its uh, symbolic impact is increased depending on institution, on critique that it is somehow surrounded with. So uh, nowadays I wouldn't imagine uh, an art object that would be um, an art object in its um, um, in its in its uh, um, goal and its impact. Uh, actually, you know um, what was initial goal of art uh, to to bring some kind of paradisal um, um, paradisal experience. Uh, to to hell uh, to, oh. to life to life which is hell uh, and then with modernism it overturns to make um, uh, the art object uncanny and to make uh, art object even more alienated than the alienation of life. Uh, uh, so I think that we still exist in, in this construct, this Copernican overturn that happened in modernist uh, um, uh, context, and we, we have to deal with it. So um, uh, nowadays uh, we, um, we somehow tease ourselves by art uh, because art is negative. It should be negative. It should be critical. It should be constantly um, somehow um creating discomfort whereas for instance platonov uh, when he talked about art uh in communist condition he would uh, he claimed that in communist condition perhaps the main art uh, would be communication of heart to heart and the objects as mediation would not be needed i mean this is platonov's idea that the mediated object as, as a created object on which you, um, which you exhibit and look at it in some kind of heterotopic uh, place. I mean, museums would not be needed in communism, I think, because the whole thing is certain, certain sort of creative production. Uh, this is my uh, very, very, um, speculative rumination. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I would say it's it's a really a picture which is uh, understandable and somehow graspable. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, um, but but th there is something which I just want to con con uh, have your confirmation for. It also means that this kind of uh, you you. Use the word struggle or, or 
you know, a, a process of of uh, of uh, conversion of two seemingly binary things. Uh, uh, that process uh, sometimes I, I I was in another completely another another context was call, was calling negotiation, mm. you know, and that negotiation is a constant work. The mind is in a constant state of negotiation. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, the, like it could be called struggle also, but str struggle we understand as something uh, uh, really tiresome, and and then uh, which would then bring the end of the struggle, you know, somehow. But the constant negotiation is for me something which gives you a sort of state in between. Mm -hmm. where you have to count on all the sides visible or possible or thinkable but uh, what uh, what did you mean by struggle in what sense did you use struggle struggle of i i heard it from you when, when you were talking about uh, speculative thinking and applied thinking oh, yeah. okay sure sure yeah yeah yes i uh, i would agree yes negotiation uh, can be the case Although, it's a constant thing. There is never a, a reaching the goal in a way, or is it? Well, it's not theological at all. It, it's, dialect, it's dialectical because it's dialogical, right? Negotiation is dialogical and hence it is dialectical. And uh -huh. then uh, it is also not guaranteed as the ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, product, which you are simply... Uh, replicating and applying. Yeah, so in this sense, art art is uh, for me a, a sort of a, a record on the process, you know, mm. which is just stopped at some place because of the author's uh, uh, decision or some kind of circumstances or some kind of canon or convention or something. But Yes, but you know, uh, um, uh, I'm a, I'm a little bit perplexed when I'm I, I'm al always perplexed when I'm asked the question about art. Uh, 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 um, I'm I'm developing this complex um, uh, structure, and then all of a sudden I'm uh, just put in the corner and uh, just forced to answer the question. And how this applies to art? Uh, and then uh, the whole difficulty starts. Well, um, the problem with it is that art is, is, is very historical. I mean, it's a historical phenomenon. And uh, the way you apply it uh, today, the way we deal with it today could not be the case um, of its practice in, at the end of 19th century or uh, in, in the Renaissance period. I, I think... Um, um, it's very much uh, connected with the with what we lack. I mean, with what we lack. Art is very much connected with what we lack, and how we um, uh, reconstitute this lack in different social and uh, socioeconomic conditions. Um, therefore, uh, I mean. Uh, it is very natural that in historical socialism, art was so different. And it was different not only because certain practices were forbidden, but because certain conditions that existed in types of production were extended and expanding in this and not the other type of uh, artistic practice. Therefore, uh, when we make uh, speculations and philosophic speculations, I cannot generate the universal idea of art. And oh, yeah. it's, it's difficult for me to answer uh, this question. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree, yeah. Pl plus the art will probably or can, uh, can just be teased. Yeah, it can disappear, as you said, in communism, it won't be necessary. I think, uh, uh, you know, I was recently at the opening of the Victoria Foundation. And uh, when I was in this premises, 
I have never seen anything like that. It's like a cosmic ship, by the way. And also <laughs> the first uh, impression that I had that I am in some kind of a very airy and uh, very light uh, uh, neoliberal cosmic ship, um, which creates uh, some kind of uh, um, beautiful ideas about culture. And uh, the concept is that it's not an art uh, space or museum, but uh, some sort of cultural production. Um, and uh, mm, for instance, something that was so crucial for uh, contemporary art that it kept its own lexicon um, somehow mm, separate from uh, pop art, from from show business, right? This was really very important that the edifice of art was separated from certain kind of entertainment uh, businesses. So this was totally overturned and collapses into one pool of show business, entertainment, consumption, production, uh, social bodies uh, interacting with each other in this huge ship of um, neoliberal, uh, nepotist uh, Russian uh, uh, capitalism. And uh, I think that in these premises and in this space, I can imagine that art as we imagined is for imagined in it for the last hundred years would probably not be imaginable because uh, the space that is created will not be producing that, uh, that kind of product. Because you know, when you are in an exhibition hall and you are looking at, at the exhibit, you simply cannot perceive the other wall. It is so big, it is unperceivable. So, the, the whole thing is made unperceivable as some kind of the body buzz uh, of, of the attending crowds, attending crowds recreating in these premises. And, and the first idea that I had that, yes, if it's gonna, if it's moving that direction, then probably the, the way art was imagined would not be possible here, or at least in Russia. If there are no questions. If we don't hear you, Anton. No, no, I, I, I'm sure there are more questions. Um, guys, there are a few more minutes left. Uh, if you have some questions, now is the time to ask. Thank you, Katie, very much. This, this was really... Um, uh, uh, such a refreshment in uh, in our lives. I mean, thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we end the session now to be continued next Tuesday with the final talk in the series. And I hope to see you then. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day, everybody. Ciao. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank everybody. you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Goodbye.